As the world finds itself in the midst of a pandemic, healthcare systems around the globe are being praised and criticized now more than ever. Each country's response to COVID-19 puts its respective medical system really on trial for how it protects its citizens and provides affordable quality healthcare. Today's guest, Dr. Zeke Emanuel, in his recently published book, Which Country Has the World's Best Healthcare, provides a well-researched and truly a comprehensive framework that compares 11 countries. And as we will soon hear, this certainly was no easy task. Hi everyone, I'm Jim Falk, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. So now let me welcome Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel. He's the Vice Provost for Global Initiatives and Chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health, Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also the Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. He's the author of several books, including Healthcare Guaranteed and Reinventing American Healthcare. Probably would not surprise you that he worked closely with President Obama on um, uh, President Obama's work on reforming health care. And he's also now serving and working on uh, Joe Biden's uh, coronavirus task force. He's an oncologist by training, and he received his MD and doctorate in political philosophy at Harvard. We're going to come back to that. Zeke, thanks for joining us. It's great to see you. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, I was fascinated, though, that you received your doctorate, earned your doctorate in political philosophy. So you were still just sort of wrestling between which way you're going to go. Uh, a little bit. I, I had um, realized when I went to Washington to write for the New Republic that uh, being a journalist and covering things isn't what I wanted to do. I then returned to Harvard for my second year because I didn't have a plan B. Um, and did a second year, but I was fortunate enough to be able to teach at Harvard College um, while I was uh, in medical school. And uh, I realized that that was much more what I really wanted to do. I thought I was a good teacher and I thought the idea of doing research, so I applied to do a PhD in political philosophy um, and focus on bioethics and health policy issues. And so that's how I got my uh, start in this area. And, you know, virtually all my research has been uh, bioethics, uh, health policy kind of areas. Well, I want to turn to your book. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. And it was because I, I knew so little about uh, health care. You know, we, we read the, the stories in, in the papers, but we realized that we're just really skating at, at the surface. I'm not going to begin like so many of your interviews by asking which country has the best, because I know how evasive you will be at that, at least in the beginning. But do tell us more about um, the challenges you had in gathering the data for these 11 countries and um, how, uh, how did you pick the countries? Well, first on how we picked the countries, I wanted to pick countries that would be in some sense representative paradigmatic cases. So, you know, we, uh, liberals tend to like anything Scandinavian. So we had our Scandinavian country in Norway, which I had known a little bit about, but, but nowhere near the detail that is in the book. Um, Britain and Canada, because they always are part of the punching bag. Um, the WHO had, when it did, it did the first ranking of countries, had France number one. So we thought we should have France. Um, I knew that the German and Dutch systems um, the Dutch system in particular in the Netherlands, uh, often highly rated because it's a sort of managed competition system that lots of health policy people in the U.S. look to. Uh, the German system I thought was uh, very important because the original uh, from the 1880s. Um, and then Australia, again, I knew something about They had a very, very uh, uh, robust uh, pharmacy benefits management program. Uh, China, I thought, would be a, a very good contrast as the other world superpower. And Taiwan gets, you know, if you talk to anyone who's ever been in Taiwan, gets rave reviews. So we thought we ought to cover that. So that, that's the sort of collection. Fortunately, they also, and by the way, we did Switzerland because conservatives in the United States often like Switzerland and, and sing its prayers. They have very different ways of financing. They have very different philosophies, if you will. Um, they have different you know, kinds of government. So it, it provided a contrast in almost every way you could imagine uh, uh, to get these countries. Obviously, it's not comprehensive. There are many countries left out with subtle differences that may be very, very high. You know, we've 
there are various aspects of the Italian system, which actually rank pretty highly uh, by lots of people's uh, uh, standards. Um, so, and we don't have a Latin American country. We don't have uh, uh, some other countries that often get high ranks. Now you mentioned uh, uh, WHO ranking. How often is that done and why is that considered not very reliable? Well, it's the, it was the granddaddy of them all. It was done in 2000 when a man who's now at the uh, University of Washington, Chris Murray was there, had a lot of mathematical formulae and, and uh, um, a little bit of a black box. Uh, Chris is, is famous for his beautiful graphics. So it had a lot of beautiful graphics, um, but it, also seemed implausible uh, once you actually looked at the ranking. Yes, France was number one and Italy was number two, but you know there's a whole slew of countries, um, Oman, uh, Cyprus, that rank ahead of the United States. And you say, all right, that might be what we don't do necessarily that well. But they also rank ahead of places like Germany and you're like, eh, that doesn't seem plausible. So something's wrong. And then two wags from uh, Britain <laughs> noted, well, there's this correlation between how well the country does in the uh, soccer uh, world <laughs> league and uh, the, you know, ranking in the WHO. Maybe it's really that that drove this. And um, once you show that there's this high correlation to something totally irrelevant, you're like, eh, maybe this isn't a good method. And they haven't really repeated it. I think they got, um, um, you know, pretty, it, it just seemed implausible once people began picking it apart. There have been a number of others, as I mentioned in the book, uh, we, uh, we and some French colleagues counted nine different measures, including the WHO, Bloomberg does one, um, various other organizations uh, uh, do this uh, because rankings seem to get a lot of eyeballs and in the internet era, eyeballs are what count. Um, and there seems to be no consistency. You know, sometimes a country like Norway will be in the top 10 or, you know, France will be in the top 10 or, uh, so, and then they'll be 23rd. Um, and so it, it, it makes you just scratch your head and say, all right, th this isn't making a lot of sense. And one of the things that did convince me is that simple ranking, just giving numbers is a very stupid idea because healthcare is so complex and it really depends upon what you focus on. So what these rankings end up with is people focus on one or two items. If they're quantitative, they tend to look at, you know, dollars spent, doctors and per thousand people and things like that. And, you know, that is not really what people want. And I think not that informative about how well a system's performing. As I, as I mentioned, I, I did read your book and the, the first country you look at is the United States and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, I read that and then read the rest of the book and came back and reread the chapter on the United States. Uh -huh. And I'd like you to tell the, our, our, our audience a little bit more about some of the measures that you use, such as obviously we'll get more into prescription drugs and, and, and drugs, but training, hospital care, long-term care, just so our audience has a sense of what you're, what you're comparing. Well, we use 22 metrics and you know, the main thing is, um, and, and some of them are quantitative, but a lot of them are qualitative, like, uh, you know, ones that are, in, you know, do you have comprehensive benefits? Well, we think this is kind of important. Um, and, you know, one of the things that surprised to me, and I thought I knew a lot and, and surprised to lots of other people is, look, Canada, for example, in their program doesn't cover drugs. Some provinces do, but you know, it's not part of the mandatory program. That's a historical legacy, but it means it's not comprehensive in the way that we expect and the way the United States, you know, finally solved in terms of uh, uh, Medicare in, in the early 2000s. Um, then you also want, you know, how much am I going to pay when I go see the doctor or the hospital? People want to know, do I have free choice of doctor, free choice of hospital, free choice of insurer? They often put big emphasis on waiting times for various procedures. So we made a list of 22, some of which the average person is concerned about, some of which health policy people and the person people should be concerned about, even if they're not. And then some that are for specific populations or more likely are going to become increasingly important if you uh, look at 
health systems as they're going to evolve over the next 25 years. So as you mentioned, both mental health and long-term care are two issues that undeniably are going to become really important over the next 25 years. Most evaluations don't include them or don't think about them, and we thought that they were important and, and needed to be included in uh, this kind of assessment of health systems. And one of the things that I wasn't aware of until I read your book was just how decentralized healthcare systems are, where in case, many cases we assume that that is not the situation. Everyone talks about the Canadian healthcare or the French healthcare, but in Canada and Switzerland, it, it varies greatly between provinces or, or cantons. Yeah, uh, that's not just true in those countries, but yes. So in Canada, just to take a concrete example, and then I'll generalize it, you know, there's a general law, uh, uh, the Health Act, which sets five principles and, the, you know, has the federal government paying for a, a lot, almost all of it to the provinces, but then the provinces specify details, which is why some provinces will cover drugs, but it's not true all across provinces. Um, and, you know, for those of who follow Canada closely, you know, the Western provinces have been the ones really driving comprehensive health care in Canada, uh, mainly because they're rural and um, uh, they don't have the big urban cities of Toronto and, and Montreal, where health care has been sort of driven by these hospitals and, and physician systems. And the rural areas need to provide services to very, very disparate people. But that issue that it's province by province, as you mentioned, Switzerland, it's canton by canton, Australia, uh, you do have some national government and the national government does pay for things, but then uh, very heavily regional in terms of paying. Uh, Norway also has four regional health authorities that govern and, and oversee the hospitals. Now there's much more coordination over time and consistency. Um, and that single payer notion, you know, we think all these countries are single payer, but that again is not true. It is true that in almost all of them, there's a payment to the government and then the government pays. But in some cases, the government pays directly to doctors and hospitals. Um, but in other cases, like uh, the Netherlands and Germany, the government pays to insurance companies. They call them sickness funds. Um, and then they organize the care and they organize the doctors and they pay the doctors. Um, and so uh, you can have systems that are, are uh, very different uh, in how they organize the care. So at least Switzerland, Germany, and Netherlands have insurance companies as intermediaries. And France is this funny place where there is a statutory system, so a government system, but it's, it's broad, it covers lots of services, but very thin, there's very high copay. So 95% of the population have supplemental insurance. Indeed, the government almost requires supplemental insurance um, uh, to cover the copays and to add choice and, and other things uh, for people. Um, so very, very, very different ways of organizing care across these countries. And in so many of the countries, really caring insurance is mandated with very high penalties. And I don't know which country you want to identify, but certainly that is the case in, in, in France. Yeah, uh, Netherlands, Switzerland, you have to have private insurance, right, through a sickness fund or a private insurer in the case of Switzerland. And if you don't, they put you on and they, they penalize, you know, they take the premium out of you and they penalize you. And so... You know, one of the things, the, some of you may recognize the name Uwe Reinhardt. He was a great health policy expert at Princeton. And he said, you know, the problem with the American system is we make this a mandatory, but then the penalty for not doing it is so low that it's not really mandatory. Whereas other countries that take this seriously, you know, they mandate you have health insurance. And then if you don't have it, they basically charge, penalize you the cost of the premium. So everyone gets it. Um, and that, I think, is, is a difference between the United States and other countries. And I think, you know, there's a sort of um, uh, uh, schizophrenia, you might say, among Democrats who passed the Affordable Care Act. We wanted everyone to get insurance, but we wanted not to penalize people who didn't get insurance because, you know, tax or penalizing them with a heavy financial penalty would be too painful for them. Well, if it's too painful for them that then they're not going to buy insurance and you're not going to achieve the universal coverage you want. And so I think, you know, the Netherlands, Switzerland, France, they've decided universal coverage is what we want. And if you're not getting it, we're forcing you to get it. And uh, um, 
you know, that's the that's one way of getting it. Um, uh, so which going. country um, is most say similar to what you were trying to accomplish with the affordable health care with Obamacare? I, I think, you know, um, I've written and I about two or three, four weeks ago, wrote in, in the Wall Street Journal that, you know, in many ways, the system in Germany and the Netherlands is one that we could really adopt in the United with, with the fewest changes and would be the most, um, uh, you might say, uh, compatible with our underlying philosophy. So there we pay, they pay to the government, the government then pays insurers, people have to pay a small premium to insurers for the poor, it's subsidized, and then You've got choice of doctor, um, you've got a sort of uh, more uniform payment system to doctors, um, uh, but there's coordination of care, there's various innovative programs, especially the Dutch, they're a very innovative group and they've done a lot of innovation in payment and delivery. Um, and that is, you know, we already have that in many ways in the federal employee health benefits program, Medicare Advantage, the sort of managed care part of Medicare. And, it, uh, we have it in the exchanges. It wouldn't be a very complex way of moving our system closer to uh, a universal healthcare coverage system. And, and there are a lot of advantages. A lot of the um, administrative complexity we have would go away if we move towards that system. And employers, you know, could easily slot into it. So one of our viewers asked this: In order to improve the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, should Obamacare be scrapped or should it be revised? And what parts, uh, he or she asked, would you keep or, 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 or modify? Well, you know, part of the problem is what you mean by Obamacare. You know, as I like to remind my students, Obamacare, uh, the, the bill, the Affordable Care Act, is over 906 uh, pages um, and then, you know, had some amendments to it as well. So what do you mean? If you mean the exchanges and the expansion of Medicaid, um, I think, you know, you're in Texas. Texas is not going to expand Medicaid. If we want to get, and therefore there is no path to universal coverage in the United States. We will never get to 99% coverage uh, if, uh, you know, Texas continues uh, the way it, it is. Uh, so we're going to have to expand Medicaid uh, in a way, and we've proposed nationalizing it. Well, if you nationalize it, you know, we also made the system more complex by having Medicaid and the exchanges. I think one of the things we can do is to bring them back and merge them um, uh, in a very effective uh, system. So I, I think we need to think again, that would still be building on the Affordable Care Act, building on the 10 essential benefits, building on caps on out-of-pocket payments. There are lots of things that we would be uh, still using that came from the Affordable Care Act that have made a big difference in the American healthcare system. So I, th I view it as the next uh, reform built on the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I think, uh, but it, it will, it would make some substantial changes in that framework. So Nathan asks, why has the United States been so resistant to the notion of universal health care as an entitlement? Whoa. The big question. The history um, of it. You know, I, I think at this moment uh, with Black Lives Matter, a lot of people will say uh, that race has some element to uh, do with it. You know, when we uh, uh, passed Social Security um, and unemployment insurance, there were groups that were left out um, and not covered a lot based upon race, like um, housekeepers, uh, domestic workers, uh, farmers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a large part of the view also of Medicaid was, you know, it's, it's for the other. Um, uh, there's a, often a, a phrase among policy people in Washington that programs for the poor are poor programs because we end up starving them. Um, what is interesting is now that Medicare, Medicaid has been expanded, you have about 75 million people on Medicaid. Um, people actually like it. Um, and we will have a huge swath more because of COVID, because people who've lost uh, their jobs are also losing their employer-sponsored insurance, they're going to end up on Medicaid. One of the nice things about Medicaid is those co-pays, deductibles, 
pretty low. They're not zero. I, I say zero but here, but no, they're not zero, but they are incredibly low. We're talking about single dollars, not hundreds of dollars. And I think people end up liking that. Now, they don't have as much choice of specialists, especially, um, but you know, that's, there are some trade-offs and people seem willing to take the trade-off. I but as you think, write yourself, in reality, it's extremely difficult for any country to go from private financing to a single payer. So what correct. gives you hope? And, and, well, and also there was a big philosophy, you know, I mean, I shouldn't underestimate. So race is one element. The Cold War is another element. After the war, when a lot of countries went to universal coverage, Britain in 46 and others, you know, they viewed this as a reward for World War II. We expanded employer-sponsored insurance and the idea of expanding government insurance, you know, we were in a battle with Russia and with communism and socialism, and that looked socialistic to us. And so it got caught up in that uh, battle. Um, as costs have risen, um, as it's become more uh, viewed as an essential fundamental uh, uh, aspect of, of uh, life, I think you can see, you know, the, if the Affordable Care is, Act has done anything, it's like it's converted people to everyone ought to have health care, and there's really no excuse for us to have 10% uninsured um, and going up. Not yeah, going I was going to ask you that. How much do you think it's increased now with, uh, you know, 40, 45 million Americans now that are unemployed? Well, we've seen a 5 million, you know, from a few months ago, a 5 million number increase. I think part of that is going to have to salt out because with the $600 a week um, uh, added payment for uninsurance, people can afford the uh, exchanges. Um, but I think you're going to see in January uh, a real reckoning, as it were, with a lot more people, tens of millions of more people uh, losing employer-sponsored insurance and ending up on Medicaid. And then I think the country, you know, people who've had employer sponsored insurance are going to demand, we need a, a solid safety net, this holy safety net that it's very difficult to navigate um, is something that has to end. And, you know, it, it's really hard to justify the complexity we have. Employer sponsored insurance, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, VA, um, you know, TRICARE and all these other, I mean, that just makes no, no sense. And uh, as I mentioned before, it adds tremendously to our administrative costs, r literally hundreds of billions of dollars. So when we're talking about employer provided health care, Don wants to know just how common is it around the world? How common is employer provided health insurance? Um, as a fundamental way of going, not common. On the other hand, in many countries, employer sponsored insurance as a supplement is common. So I mentioned Canada doesn't require drug coverage. So as a consequence, a lot of employers offer it as a fringe benefit insurance for it, or one of the uh, two of the most uh, services least covered, uh, I guess most countries don't cover it, are dental care and vision care. Um, and they also are frequently provided by uh, employers. Um, so not as a core, but as supplemental is very common. Financing is a different issue. A lot of countries use employers uh, and employer uh, tax to um, uh, finance healthcare. Germany uh, being the leading example, they started it in the 1880s and they've continued it that where uh, payroll tax on employers is used to finance uh, healthcare. So one of our viewers, and it's W. X. Spoon, and uh, I, I'm definitely going to get to the United States. Um, I've been <laughs> purposely not doing that, but he's, why no discussion of outcomes? Where do we stand in the United States? Where would we stand? So this is as good time as any for for perhaps you to say that uh, about our ranking as you as you see well, it, and and where we can improve. Yeah, need to it, improve. It, it, it depends what you mean by outcomes. I, I take it you mean outcomes by in, in terms of health outcomes. How do we? I think them? yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay, because there are other outcomes. There's financial outcomes, um, uh, innovation outcomes. Um, but if you take health outcomes, the first thing to note is we're not so hotsy tatsy when it comes to overall life expectancy. Um, if that's an outcome that you care about, 
Uh, we're sort of 78, 79 years. The Japanese are the world's leader for a big country and they're 84 overall. Women always tend to, in every country, tend to do better than men. Um, uh, they have more longevity uh, than men do. Um, if you look at particular diseases, and in another research project, I've be, been looking at particular diseases, we are in the top echelon when it comes to cancer, um, and cancer is the number two killer, but we're not at the top echelon when it comes to heart attacks. Uh, we're not in the top echelon when it comes to infant mortality, not even close. And even if you're white and you're relatively well off, you're also uh, you're not near. You're not number one in the world uh, uh, in that category. Uh, many other countries do much, much better than we do. Um, the Scandinavian countries, uh, Denmark, um, and so it's it's uh, it really depends on what you look at. Uh, for all the money we spend on outcomes, uh, we do not actually rank that highly, except in cancer, where we do. And even in cancer, I can tell you that there are, part, you know, we're number one in breast cancer, no matter who you are. But if you look at childhood leukemia, where we innovate, we develop all the new therapies, you know, Germany actually does a better job uh, for its kids. Um, and uh, so I think there's a lot of room for improvement on those outcomes. Uh, so there's so much attention, of course, on pharmaceuticals, and I want to get to that. Um, one, Phil Greedy says, where in the world do you see the most innovation for drugs? Well, again, I think, you know, I, I think we've got to be careful about what we mean by innovation. And I have been quite critical. We, we, get, we develop all these new drugs. Well, it, it's important to emphasize um, what we mean by innovation it has to improve uh, longevity, uh, decrease uh, symptoms, uh, mm -hmm probably have lower side effects or lower costs to be innovative. Uh, producing a drug that is really similar to other drugs and charging more for it and saying, oh, we've innovated. We've got a new drug for, you know, I'm a, I don't think you mentioned it, but I'm an oncologist. We've got a new drug for nausea and vomiting. And when that new drug gets compared to existing drugs, it's no better, but it's two and a half times more expensive. That's not an innovation. And we should not say, well, we produce new drugs. Well, we did produce a new drug, but it wasn't innovative. Um, and so I think we have to be careful. Second thing I would say is, you know, just because we have new drugs doesn't mean we're necessarily developing new drugs for the right things. And let me give you a very good example um, that I think is, you know, fundamentally important. Again, I'm an oncologist. Last I looked, which was about six months ago, there are 650 cancer drugs in clinical trials with humans. Uh, we're developing lots of cancer drugs. Why? Every new cancer drug, the cost is $10,000 a month. Every one, no matter how much uh, life it prolongs. If it's four weeks or if it's curative, it's about $100,000, okay? So we're developing a lot of cancer drugs. The financial incentive is there. On the other hand, uh, as a society, we are very reluctant to pay large amounts of money for antibiotics, even though they save life. Um, and by the way, if we developed a, a really blockbuster antibiotic that was really fantastic, you know what we would do with it? Not use it. <laughs> Could conserve it for very rare cases where it's resistant to other drugs. And we're not willing to pay a lot of money for that. And the result is less than 40 clinical trials with human beings on new antibiotics. And yet all of us know the WHO, the CDC has put antibiotic resistance bacteria at a very high rate for threatening the world. Um, and yet we don't invest in antibiotics because we don't pay for it. Um, this doesn't seem to me to be innovative. This seems to me to be, excuse the French, ass backwards. High value healthcare innovations or, or areas are not invested in because the returns we have, the way we pay for drugs does not make the returns worth it. That is not the way to establish innovation. And so to just say we produce a lot of new drugs, that doesn't measure innovation in the way we want. Or we have more drug patents than any other country. Yes, but that doesn't measure innovation. There are areas where we are really knocking it down, you know, CAR T, this new cancer immunotherapy 
absolutely fantastic, developed at University of Pennsylvania, my institution, um, super expensive, but it's definitely an innovation. It takes people on death's door and cures them uh, or seems to cure them. Um, that's an innovation, but uh, we, we need to be careful about what we mean. Well, let's talk about a, a drug that everyone is waiting for, and we're seeing uh, competition throughout the world. And uh, I'm very lucky, Zeke, at the World Affairs Council this summer, I have two remarkable interns working with us in our programs department. And one of them is Morgan Henley, who's going to join us now. Uh, Morgan is a rising uh, senior at the University of Texas at Austin and, and uh, uh, helped me prepare to meet with you. And I know she has some questions on uh, vaccinations. Morgan, welcome. Go ahead. Yes, good morning. Uh, my question today is regarding a COVID-19 vaccine. So when a vaccine does finally become available, how do you imagine its distribution to the American public will proceed? Do you think it might be government funded and free? And do you think it's going to be made available to everyone at the same time or certain risk populations? Well, certainly the answer to the last question is no, it can't. We won't have enough no matter what happens. Um, so let's let's uh, rewind for a second. Um, I think the last number I saw is we have 19 candidate vaccines in clinical trials with human beings. Um, there are about 140 or more that are, you know, in various uh, uh, stages of uh, development in the laboratory. Um, of those 19, four have entered uh, what are called phase three or the trial to test out whether they actually protect people from COVID, not that they just raise the antibodies. Two of those are Chinese, one is British, and one is American Moderna. Um, who knows exactly when they're going to report out? Um, you know, there's claims it'll be September, October. Uh, it depends upon nature and how often people are exposed and actually come down with uh, COVID, that, so you can compare were the people with the vaccine more protected than people without the vaccine. Um, but say it, we find out, you know, October, November, December, something like that, uh, you still have to produce hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of doses. Uh, many of these vaccines will require two doses. Uh, so to get the United States, we'd need over 600 million doses to be given to people twice. The production, actually, once you have a vaccine, producing the vaccine, putting it into vials under super sterile conditions, shipping it out, getting it enough needles and uh, syringes to actually inject people, getting enough people to actually be there to inject people and to trace who got the first dose and who needs the second dose. That is a monumental task. Uh, just saying it gives, should give you the sense of how monumental it is. And we're not ready. Uh, uh, I work for the Center for American Progress part-time uh, as a senior fellow, and we literally, today is Wednesday, uh, I think yesterday, released a report looking at all the potential hurdles we might have and the bottlenecks and what we need to do to overcome those potential bottlenecks. We're not there. You know, a simple, bo a simple bottleneck. Do we have enough glass vials to put the vaccine in, you know? We've got Corning. There are two other big manufacturers that are in Europe. One would love to build a plant here. We haven't approached them to the best of our ability to determine it. Syringes, you would think, oh, syringes, they're cheap, they're low tech, they're just plastic. Well, we're going to need nearly a billion of them. We're not ready. And so what you know, about this loan that was made yesterday by the US government to Kodak? Yeah, I think that helps. <laughs> but it's not, it, it's one part of a very complicated puzzle. So one part is good, but you know, you need a loan to, uh, uh, or help with Corning for, or some other company for glass. You need a, a, a work with BD for production lines for syringes. You need to get up, you know, we estimate 7,300 vaccination centers staffed by people who can give up to 30,000 vaccines a month. I mean, the, the, an enormous effort. And uh, I don't think uh, the administration has gotten its arms around this problem. So even if you have a vaccine, you know, I think it's very unlikely average Joes like you and I are gonna get, um, get a shot in the arm before fall 2021 and maybe not till fall 
uh, until uh, early 2022. There was this article yesterday in Foreign Affairs by uh, Tom Bolicki and Chad Bra uh, Chad Bown, uh, and it was titled uh, "The Tragedy." I've been exchanging of uh, uh, emails with Tom about that. Did you? Yeah. Well, the the title is "The Tragedy of Vaccine Nationalism," and it really points out where the United States, and maybe some people will disagree with us on this, but the United States is not taking the leadership role that historically it would take in situations like this. How concerned are you about this nationalism in countries literally competing and working behind each other's backs? That's a big problem. And by the way, there is no guarantee that we're going to be the ones to develop this vaccine. You know, we've got investments in um, Pfizer, which is working with the German company. We've got investments in AstraZeneca for their uh, uh, product. Um, you know, the Chinese could come out ahead um, of us. Uh, others could come out uh, ahead. There's no guarantee we're going to be number one. So vaccine nationalism might be short-sighted, uh, ser seriously short-sighted. Um, it, it's, it's an issue about how to distribute vaccine around the world that we have been working on. I assume, and I think uh, those people who attend the World Affairs Council and, you know, you don't have to be a political realist to say, it's gonna be really hard for any democratic government, not to mention other governments, not to immunize their people first. The question is how much do they immunize and what do they do with the extra? And how much do they support buying extra? Um, and so we've been working on that issue. Um, first of all, there is this international uh, facility called COVAX. Which and when you say we, who are you talking about? When you well, say I put together a group of 20 people from around the world, 10 different countries to think this through. Okay. That, that, you know, one of the things Tom calls for in that article in Foreign Affairs is a fair and equitable distribution system. But let me just say, no one hitherto has defined fair and equitable. We think we've got a way to think about that. Um, it's complicated. Um, it's one element of, you know, considerations. There will be geopolitics, there will be alliances, there will be economics, but there also needs to be ethics at the table. And, and we think we can add to those considerations. Um, but once you have, so, so you have a co this COVAX facility being set up by um, the World Health Organization, Gavi and CEPI, um, and they'll have they hope $18 billion to buy vaccine. Similarly, um, some of the uh, vaccine manufacturers like AstraZeneca, J&J, &J have said they would like to distribute their vaccine fairly and equitably, but they don't know what that means. And so, you know, you need a framework to help them. But I think nationalism, some kind of nationalism is going to be inevitable, but you want it limited. And again, I think we provide some helpful ideas about how to think about that limitation um, so that all the vaccine doesn't get hijacked um, by uh, rich countries. So uh, Marco asked, and, and again, it, I think it's on the same su subject really of, of drugs and the, and the cost in lobbying groups. What lobbying groups have the most to lose if healthcare costs could be better controlled? Uh, and, and how <laughs> likely do you see, how likely do you see the U United States overcoming their resistance? And I think about, you know, the, the big granddaddy of them all is, is pharma. Well, that, so uh, um, let, let me just put this into context. The United States spends just under 18% of GDP on healthcare. Um, projections a decade ago, were, we'd be past 20%. We've actually done a reasonably good job of holding the line, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, second, um, most other countries, uh, Switzerland is number two, Norway number three in terms of dollars per person, you know, Netherlands, they're at, in the 12%, 10%, 11% range. Um, we're not getting down there, just realistically. If we held healthcare costs don't grow any faster than inflation, that would be a huge victory. Who would be affected? Well, pharma is number one. We are the only country, as my book documents well, and we've got a separate article coming out. We're the only country in the world, only country, let me repeat it, in the world that gives pharmaceutical companies a patent and therefore exclusivity and then lets them set the price. You know, those of you who've taken economics 101, you know the outcome of that. 
it's why we regulate utilities, um, why we regulated the phone industry. Um, you've got to regulate those prices under those conditions of giving someone a monopoly, either through patents or FDA approval. Um, the difference in healthcare costs between us and Europe, about a third of it is just pharmaceutical prices. But that's only part of it. The second big group is hospitals. Hospital prices are regulated when it comes to Medicare and Medicaid. The government tells the uh, hospitals what the, it'll pay. Um, but when it comes to private insurance, that's a negotiations. Private insurance is typically on the uh, losing end of the leverage because hospitals have consolidated to increase their leverage in marketplaces. Um, and we have seen over the last two decades a very big increase on hospital prices to private insurance. One of the reasons our premiums are going up. So if we were to regulate hospital prices, you know, hospitals would see their uh, revenue drop. A third group is doctors, and not just doctors, but nurses. Almost every employed group in the healthcare sector has very high salaries when you look at other countries. And so if we were to regulate um, that, many doctor salaries like radiologists would come down or ophthalmologists would come down. Some might go up like primary care doctors. It's a little more nuanced when it comes to physician and, and nurse uh, salaries. Um, but that's where the money is. Those three areas, they're the top three areas we spend healthcare dollars in, and they're the top areas that would be affected if we actually tried to, to control prices more. And I think we should, you know, 18% uh, spending on healthcare, no one in the world can say, it's, there's not enough money in healthcare. There's more than enough money in healthcare. It's badly managed. And some of the prices are just way too high um, so we, we well, need to get that Give, give us control. a sense, because I don't remember all the figures in, in the book, but like the out-of-pocket cost that someone would pay for drugs, say, in France or Taiwan versus what we pay in the United States is really astronomical. Yes. So the total drug spending on dollars, and by the way, let's be clear, the United States is not a uh, place where we consume a lot of drugs per person. Uh, we don't consume a lot of health care per person. You know, if you look at the number of times that you and I go to the doctor on average compared to a German, it's way down. We're very low. Um, but it's the prices. So you've got a, you know, total cost is price times volume. So our volume is relatively low, but our prices are very high per unit. And that's the rub. So, you know, just take, uh, forget drugs for a second. Just take something like MRIs. Our MRI costs are in the private insurance world are 10 times what they are in places like Taiwan. 10 times the price. Just doesn't make any sense, right? But one um, of the things and, and I will here... tell you in, in some many other countries, you know, they'll run the MRI machine 20, 22 hours a day. We don't. But the defense on the drug prices one hears, and I'm really curious to see how you respond to this, is that we are subsidizing r and in other countries. It, I, I assume that was perhaps at one time the case, but is it still? Uh, look, <laughs> depends how you justify subs or how you conceive of subsidizing. We pay higher prices with higher revenues. Some, a, a portion of that is going to be allocated to R&D to the extent, you know, the world, and these are rough numbers, round about a trillion dollars is spent on drugs worldwide. About 45% of that is American spending. And yet we're only 4.2% of the world's population. So we disproportionately pay. And with that disproportionate payment, some of that money goes to R&D. But you know, let's just be blunt. The overall world R&D in drugs is about 16% of spending. Um, and uh, there's more spent on marketing, in, certainly in developed countries. Any of you who look at TV, you know where that marketing dollar is going for drugs. Um, uh, the ads used to be cars, they're now drugs. Um, and uh, so, you know, it is the case that uh, we spend a, we, we pay a very high price um, and some of it's, some of it does go to R&D, but not all of that high price goes to R&D. Um, let me just oh, make, let me just make two points about that. Um, 
the drug industry says, listen, you know, they pound their chest. We're spending a lot on R&D. So let me just ask you the crude question. Which company in the world spends the most on R&D? And hint, hint, it ain't a drug company, okay? It's Amazon. Now, what's Amazon famous for? Low prices, low profits. Oh, but you can, with low prices, low profits, still spend a lot on research. How does that work? Well, depends what you prioritize. Similarly, number two, three, four, and five are not drug companies. Volkswagen is up there. Google is up there. Amazon is up there. I mean, uh, Apple is up there. You don't need to have the high prices of drug companies to invest a lot in research. Car companies also invest a lot in research and they have nowhere near the profit margin that drug companies do. Um, the second point I would emphasize is if you look at the price differential between the United States price and Europe's average price for the top 20 drugs, just the top 20, we're not talking about thousands of drugs, just the top 20, it more than covers all the money spent on research for drugs. Just the top 20, that price differential. So I don't know that we need such high prices for research and development. I think that's been often been the excuse, but it is more of an excuse than an actual justification. So one of the uh, things you often hear too is, well, the Canadian health system, uh, it's all right, but there's this long wait time and that's why wealthy people who can cross the border when we could go back and forth across the border. But Ray Ledieu says, uh, expound on why Canadians with financial means come to the United States. It's, it's much less than you think. Yes, it is true. You know, Saudi princes come to the United States. Other rich people do often come to the United States. And let's be serious. In other countries, Australia, Canada, Britain, there are uh, Norway, there are lines. And it is very grating to the public. But let me give you a hint, hint. No lines in Germany, no lines in Norway. You don't hear about a lot of lines in France, no lines in Taiwan. You can arrange a system that has price controls, doesn't spend nearly as much as we do, and not get lines. So that is a canard. If you go towards some other system where the government has a bigger role, you will have lines. False. That's just a false claim. In some ways it's arranged, you will have a line. In other countries, you will not. And I could easily arrange a system in the United States, no lines. So we have a few more minutes and I want you to tell us why we do not want to get sick in China beyond the obvious reasons. <laughs> and yet Taiwan, that would be okay. And I, uh, it, is, is that because of the government or corruption or why such a difference between the two countries? So the, the, the biggest problem in China, the two big problems in China, is first, it's a hospital-centric healthcare system. Everything is done at a hospital. There's really no sort of private physician office system there, um, which is why many of you will know when COVID hit Wuhan, they had to rapidly build, I forget whether six, eight, 12 hospitals, literally overnight. Now that building them overnight, an amazing feat. That they had to build them, not good. And that they had to build so many, not good. It shows you the defect of their hospital-centric system. And one of the reasons for that hospital-centric system, or so is their thinking, is look, the best doctors are at the best hospitals. Um, we can't get them to do practice. Well, they don't really try. Uh, I've suggested to them, let me make a suggestion. If you told the best doctors, you can't be in this great ca comprehensive cancer center unless you are in practice two days a week and seeing people in the office, you can't work at this hospital. Guess what would happen? You would see an outpatient system with great doctors. They just haven't been willing to do that in their system. They're still Doctors get their licenses associated with hospitals. Everything is at a hospital. It's a horrible way to deliver care. Every country, other country that we looked at, 
Let me repeat that. Every other country has actually seen the use of hospitals go down and down at very different rates. The United States is way ahead of almost fair to say every other country, but every country has seen a decline in the use of the hospital because, you know, when I was training, we give all can cancer chemotherapy mainly in the hospital. Now, almost all of it we can do as an outpatient, right? We used to do hip and knee replacements in the hospital. Now we can do it ambulatory care centers. We used to do MRIs only in the hospital. Now we can do them at freestanding radiology facilities that are much cheaper. So you can move them out of the hospital, but China doesn't. The second big problem in China is trust. People do not trust healthcare. They don't trust doctors. There's still lots of bribing of doctors with the- now, Tell people about the drugs, how, how doctors are bribed to, buy, to get yeah. to so buy there, drugs. There, there, there's basically a kickback system from the pharmaceutical industry to doctors. Doctors then sell drugs and prescribe drugs. Um, a lot of American or a lot of foreign big- But didn't we have that at a time here where doctors would prescribe drugs and then they'd go on fancy cruises? It's called snake oil salesman, yes, and it was very bad, and we got rid of, uh, tried to get rid of lo a lot of that uh, uh, slush money, frankly, um, that uh, we still have some problem with that, you know, and again, oncology is a place where doctors get more money if they prescribe a more expensive drug. It's a horrible system, uh, in my opinion. I've written against it, um, but in China, there's a, you know, before surgery, you give the surgeon a, an envelope people don't trust doctors and, th and they've had a, you know, they've ha even had murder of doctors by patients who are dissatisfied. There's not a lot of integrity in that system, which is why I think it really is um, the system, not the public health responses and other things, but the healthcare system really ranks lower than the U.S. Um, so we come in about second to last? Yes. Uh, at least among these 11, as I say, we're, we're not in the top 10. So why is Taiwan so good? First of all, really low prices. Um, second of all, they have created a system where everyone's in the system. Uh, you go to the doctor, you swipe a card, um, you finish with the doctor, the card swiped again for what services the doctor provided to you, what your complaint was, what services the doctor provided to you. That allows the Ministry of Health to have very, very accurate and near real-time data. It allows them to adjust prices. So if doctors are overusing visits and stuff, they actually bring the price per visit down to reflect actual utilization. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, they focus on the necessities. Hospitals are pretty Spartan. If you want more fancy, you know, single room, blah, 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 you have to get supplemental insurance and pay for it. Um, but you can go in and, you know, see a doctor almost any time. Doctors are substantially overworked there. They see 60, 80, 90, patients a day. So we don't, you won't get what Americans get, which is time with or want, which is time with their doctor. It's a way, on the other hand, it's cheap. The prices for things are low and satisfaction. Again, one of the things we got is almost everyone in the system loves it, reports high satisfaction. Um, doctors, on the other hand, don't. And they are really the, you know, someone's got to lose and it's doctors in Taiwan. But if I were in Taiwan and I sprained my knee, I could just go get an MRI on my own. Yes, sir. Is Dr. Falk calling and saying I want an MRI? No, not Dr. Falk. Average Joe Falk shows up. I want that MRI. Yes. It's amazing. And again. And that works. Uh, people love it. Let me repeat. They don't just say, oh, this is an okay system. Love it. <laughs> Although you have to bring a member of your family to the hospital, you said. Uh, <laughs> unless you have, bring unless your you food. have the supplemental insurance for, you know, uh, upgrade. Yes, and they view in Dallas hospitals. You know, we can order catered meals and everything. It's yeah, and they view that as a luxury, and the healthcare system should not pay for it. That should be something you pay for. So they have a they have a slightly different philosophy about what basic or essential healthcare is, and for them, you know, a, a luxury meal is not something that. You ought to make your friend pay for uh, who's also paying insurance. So two more questions. Um, first from Abid, what role does malpractice insurance and the cost of litigation play in the, in the costs that we see in the United States? Much less than you think. <laughs> A few percentage points at most if you include defensive medicine. Lots of studies have looked at it and um, the fact is it's just not a big part of 
the system. Doctors always blame, well, it's because of malpractice I got that MRI on the head or the MRI in the back. The fact is there are many things driving doctors to order those tests. If you look at places like Texas that have changed their malpractice laws to, um, to make them more restrictive, to give doctors relief, they haven't seen prices come down at all. You have seen, by the way, quality probably come down uh, when the malpractice change. I'm a big so, proponent, a big proponent of malpractice reform, but that's mostly so doctors stop using it as an excuse for not for doing good medicine. We got another 45 seconds and you are advising Vice President um, Biden. So what advice are you giving him now that he should do if he is elected to get, a top, get on top of the pandemic? Well, we, uh, part of the rationale for that report that I mentioned that we released yesterday at the Center for American Progress was precisely to lay out a roadmap of, okay, let's assume on January 21st, we do have one or two or three vaccine candidates. Here's the roadmap you need to have to make sure people get it expeditiously. So that, that's just one of the products. Well, Dr. Manuel, I want to thank you for spending an hour with us. And I really do want to encourage our, our, our viewers to pick up a copy of which country has the world's best health care. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, it wasn't quite as easy read as Mark Grossman's book, a spy thriller, but I, I, I learned a hell of a lot more from it in some ways uh, about uh, health care and uh, some of the tough issues we're facing in the United States. Uh, wishing everybody a good day, and we'll see you again soon. Again, thanks so much, Zeke. Thank you very much. It's been a great interview, and I hope your uh, audience enjoyed it too.